What should Diamondbacks fans expect out of Evan Longoria? Will the Giants go big game hunting again next offseason after missing out on their key targets this winter? And the big question, will the Giants finish ahead of the D-backs in the standings? I've got Miller Thomas from Locked on D-backs who says no. I say yes. We'll get into it next. You are Locked on Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on the show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube, so check us out there if you have not already. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And where we get started, we are going to re- Join the conversation I was having yesterday with Miller Thomas from Locked On D-backs. We cut that conversation short, and this is going to be the rest of that conversation. We talk about Evan Longoria switching sides in this rivalry. We discuss next offseason, are the Giants going to be involved in Shohei Otani? And then we get into our predictions about where these teams are going to finish in the standings. It's a really interesting kind of comparison between the Giants and the D-backs. Very differently constructed teams. Uh, D-backs have some upside. People are sleeping on them, but I think the Giants will finish ahead of them. Miller disagrees. So without further delay, here's the rest of my conversation with Millard from Locked on D-backs. But, uh, <laughs> looking ahead, I mean, just because looking at your lineup right now, I definitely think you need a, a Hanniger or a Conforto to pop because Peterson had a pretty nice year last year. He had a pretty under the rated, under the radar season. I think he was even an all-star for you guys he last was. year. And then Yastrzemski, what, he's already hurt, I think, said he's day-to-day just on Roto Champs. Just a little knee thing, yeah. Yeah, he's solid, but he's not, like, a star player or anything like that. Like, he's just, like, one of those complimentary glue guys that every playoff lineup rotation needs. So I definitely think you need a Hanager or Conforto or both of them to pop for your lineup to really produce offensively because I want to get a little D-backs talking here because leaving your lineup, your third baseman who – might have been injured the last couple of years, but was pretty productive when he was on the field. Evan Longoria, as a D-backs fan, because I don't think we've talked about him yet, Ben. How should us D-backs fans feel about Evan Longoria? Obviously, he's old. Obviously, he's like 37. He's not the same elite defender as he once was. But I'm like, hey, you get 90 to 110 games out of Evan Longoria. You're just going to use him as your platoon third baseman to crush left handed pitchers which i think he could still do at a pretty high level like as a d-backs fan my expectations aren't high for evan longoria but should i have them even lower should my expectations be on the floor ben i think you pretty much nailed it like everything you said was what i was going to say the first thing i was going to say is he's old like you can you kind of see the age at times that i think he fits the d-backs a lot better in that the the d-backs have a young team and so Mm -hmm. to mix in a veteran like Evan Longoria, I think is is a really nice thing to do. But for the Giants, I mean, he was like one of the core guys of that team. And I just thought it was time to turn the page and try to get a little bit younger, more like the D-backs in that regard. But you nailed it. I mean, I think he's going to platoon. He's going to hit left-handed pitching. I would say that, you know, he was there for five years in San Francisco. And the first couple of years, it was a, you know, Bruce Bochy-led coaching staff and then Gabe Kapler comes in they do a totally new coaching staff new hitting coaches three hitting coaches and they went off offensively in 2020 obviously short season people were wondering can they do it again Longoria was one of those guys who just hit a lot better after a couple down years Uh, but in 2021 they did it again and if you look at Longoria's seasons I think I don't have them pulled up in front of me but he was much better offensively after working with these new kind of more modern hitting coaches. And so I think he he's a guy I, I really felt like should probably be platooned. And he mm-hmm. wasn't always here. He played a lot against righties as well. But if you're just platooning him, I do think defensively, he's still good. I mean, he he's really kind of steady. He's really smooth. He's really under control. And he's just a guy that players gravitate to 
leadership wise and obviously he's been in the game a long time he's even kind of a borderline hall of fame player not because of his time with the giants but his time before that and i don't know like it, the deal reflects kind of the upside and the limited upside but also just a solid uh piece on a young team to kind of provide that veteran leadership and also do a good job in a somewhat limited role defensively and hitting lefties yeah and last year you just look at his numbers like he missed some time with injury played 89 games but if we get a 767 ops and 14 home runs out of evan longoria like if he just duplicates what he did with the giants last year for the d-backs like i think that's all the value we need we just need him to split time at third with josh rojas and just bang some dingers when you get a, a hanging curveball over the middle from a lefty that's all we need i think evan longoria can definitely do that already has a house here in arizona i think he was already inching his way toward arizona maybe before he was like let me do a quick stop in san fran get some sunshine hit the beach for a little bit and then retire in az he said that. He said it towards the end of the year. Like People were asking him about his future, and he basically said, I want to come back to the Giants, but also, if, I, if that doesn't happen, I want to. I probably want to play for the D-backs, where I have a house, <laughs> really? or, I want, or I want to play for the Tampa Bay Rays, where I have a house, because he obviously started his career there. So, yeah, he, he wants to be there, so that's that's part of it, too. He's happy to be close to home. He, wa- he has kids, or at least one, and he wants his kid, his family wants him to see him uh, keep playing at least one more season where, where the kid is a little older and can experience his dad being a you know major league player close to home and free agents wanting to come to arizona that's a rarity there don't always have that and it's <laughs> probably because we don't want to pay them what they're worth but happy to see evelyn goria come i think he's going to be a nice veteran presence for this young team but ben caspic i want to know just because the giants finished with a perfect 500 record last season 81 and 81 we talked about how carlos rodan had just left this offseason we talked about their whiffs but listen i do think they brought in quality players maybe not of the carlos correa caliber but i don't like i I don't hate the hannigers and the confortos and the ross striplings of the world i think those are solid players so entering this season do you think the ceiling is higher or lower than the giants compared to last year's team that's tough. I think the ceiling might be lower, but I think the Ooh. floor is wow. higher. I yeah. think that's a good answer. Why? Yeah. Do you mostly think it's because Rodon with his that one to come in? Yeah, I feel that. I feel like it's Rodon because he he had the potential to be a Cy Young caliber player, and he was. But so many other things didn't go right. But if you had like the floor of this year's team with like kind of that upside, that's why it was so seemingly important to get a whether it was Correa or Judge or even Rodon I didn't think they were going to go out and get Rodon or bring him back because of what we just talked about with pitchers and all that but if you add some serious upside like serious upside type players to this team with such a high floor I do think that's how you really pop off and and win 90 plus games and just kind of have a lot of things go your way but this year's team, they they have a lot of depth. I just kind of see them being able to sustain injuries and all that kind of stuff. And uh, but I I don't know. It's hard to say. Like it's hard to put a cap on on a ceiling because the twenty twenty one Giants won one hundred and seven games with without Rodon and without some of the quality veterans we've discussed today. So any team can kind of pop off and have a miracle season. But realistically, I think we're looking at a mid eighties win team ish and when when the true talent is there you could you could win 90 you could win 80 but somewhere in that range this episode is brought to you by built bar are you looking for a delicious treat but you don't want all the fat and calories hello then you've got to try a built bar we've gotten through the holidays and i know a lot of people's resolution is always to eat healthier and by this time sadly oftentimes those resolutions have fallen by the wayside. But with Built Bar, you can stick to those resolutions all year long indefinitely because we're talking about a bar in which you do not have to sacrifice taste in order to get a healthy profile. Candy bar flavors and yet 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein in a typical bar. And now you don't have to wait around to get a box either. We've been telling you for years to go to built.com, but now you can go to your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk over to the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of built bars. You can pick up a four bar box 
of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs, or if you're near Sam's Club, run in and, get, and grab a 13-bar box with hit flavors brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later. How do you think the Giants organization or front office views this team and their outlook? Or do you think they're just going to the season trying to be another 500-type-ish team? Or do you think they have real expectations of going in there, maybe winning 90-plus games and making some noise in the playoffs? Or is it just this, like, just a retooling year and maybe trade a couple of these guys at the deadline, like a Brandon Crawford, who's getting a little older? I think there's a lot of pressure to win now, mm. even if it – I'm not going to say it doesn't make sense. I think I think that makes sense. They – basically there's a lot of pressure to win now because they've made the playoffs exactly one time since 2016 and that was 2021 and this is not you know this is not the pittsburgh pirates or the kansas city royals or the oakland a's you know this is a Shot. this is a bigger market team <laughs> and i could have said the d-backs but i didn't wow okay i'm sorry they the d-backs right. they they do things right. they do things well and they're on the up and up so i'm now not we're gonna have a wager at the end of this podcast for yeah. the listeners. so you keep talking your ish right now because it'll be okay <laughs> right but you know the pirates i think is a good example like where where it's kind of tolerable or expected almost to go through multiple losing seasons and kind of rebuild that way. But this is a team that expects to win year in and year out. And they had the 2021 season, but going back, you know, regressing to 81 last year, uh, there's, this is the fifth year of this new front office. And the contract was for five years for Farhan Zaidi taking over president of baseball operations. And we have not heard about an extension, although there's kind of hints that he may have been extended already but the fans have the fans are restless. I don't know if you know this, but Giants fans are very, very, very restless right now, I think, about the state of the team. The farm system, you may have noticed, like in some rankings, is not up where I think people thought they would be at this point. Uh, but yeah, I do not think it's a retooling year at all. I think the expectation is to win, but they're kind of fringe. And so they may have to make a, another big deadline acquisition like like they did in 2021 with Chris Bryant if they if they're kind of borderline at that point and they want to make that big splash that pushes them over the top but i think they're better than people think but also it's a competitive national league right away you've got the Dodgers the Padres the Mets and the Braves accounting for you know four of your six playoff spots most likely and then there's there's really a race for two more spots and you've got some other good teams like the Phillies and the Brewers and the D-backs are in that mix and oh, uh, now the Cardinals, mentioned. obviously. So I think it's it's going to be a competitive league and a uh, race in the National League this year. And the D-backs are a big part of that. They could disrupt a lot of people's plans if if they hit on kind of their upside. Oh, yeah. We're going to talk about D-backs versus Giants in one second. But I got one more question before we get there. Because after seeing the Giants' as offseason, at least try and go out there and spend money on the Aaron Judges. You know, give him potentially three to $400 million And give Carlos Correa $300 plus million. Do you think in future offseasons going forward, the Giants will be big-time players for these big-time free agents? Because, listen, this upcoming offseason is going to be one of the most talked-about ones with maybe the best free agent of all time in Shohei Otani. Do you see the Giants as a team that will also get into that market? Or do you think they will just the, the bidding will be too high because you're probably gonna have to start at like 450 over 10 years for Otani. Do you think the Giants are a team that would be willing to get into that kind of expensive bidding? I think they would. I mean they did they did it with Aaron Judge and Carlos Correa. It wasn't 450, but if, if that's what he's worth, then I think that they're going to pursue it, especially because of everything we've heard about Otani preferring to play on the West Coast. I don't know if that's totally true. I know it was true when he was first, you know, considering teams to sign with and he had those finalists and the, the Giants were one of those finalists back then yeah. in 2017, 2018. Coming off a 98 loss season, they were still considered a finalist. And so if there's some kind of preference preference to be on the West Coast and you're a team that needs stars and you've got this money to spend, they tried to also sign Harper several years ago. So they've been trying to go big game hunting here with some stars and they just haven't come away with one. But I don't see any reason they're just going to sit on the sidelines for Shohei Otani. The one exception, and I keep bringing this up on my show, is he's half a pitcher. And we were, as I just got done talking about, they're hesitant to give a 
five-year deal to Kevin Gosman. And so I wonder how that factors in to their thinking, if at all, when you consider that Shohei Otani is, you know, if you're talking about a 10, 11, 12-year deal for this guy, ultimately, are you willing to break your own seeming rule uh, about giving a long-term deal to someone who is partially a pitcher? So, and Machado yeah. was another guy who made sense, but he's not on the board anymore. It's really Shohei Otani and then a huge drop off. So it's going to be fascinating. And I think the Giants will be in the mix, but am I confident they'll come away with him? No. I think when you look at like the long term Otani contract, you have to be like, all right, I'm getting like four to five years of pitching and then like 10 years of hitting. And then you have to kind of figure out. What number you're okay with? I feel like for a tiny contract, you probably want to front load that thing so you could pay him while he's both a pitcher and hitter because by the time he's like 34, 35, he's probably going to slow down the pitching and still be one of the best sluggers in Major League Baseball, which is just a crazy statement to say. But I want to get to the finale of this podcast, Ben, because I've been doing research. I've been looking at the teams on paper, the rotation, the lineup, the bullpen. And my conclusion is I think the D-backs on paper – have a higher ceiling, maybe a lower floor than the Giants, because I do agree, the Giants have very good depth, but I'm picking the D-backs to finish ahead of the Giants in the standings this year. I think the D-backs are being completely overlooked, at least on FanDuel, because if you look at like the division odds to win the division, of course, I don't think the D-backs are going to win the division. But the fact that the Giants are like plus 1,100 to win the division, then the D-backs are like plus 4,000 to win the division, I think that disparity is so crazy to me. And I think the D-backs are actually better than the Giants entering this season. How do you feel about our D-backs versus Giants rivalry this season? I feel like we've had this conversation before, and and then at times it has played out where it's been pretty close, I think. And at times the Giants have gone on to win 107, and the D backs have like fallen apart. But okay. I feel that that this year again, I agree with you. We often agree that there's there these teams are closer than people think. I agree with you 100. percent That disparity on Fanduel, I I would bet on the D backs probably if I saw that. Uh, I mean, like I said, I don't think they're winning the division either. But yeah, it's just better um, if you want to make money. But like, yes. Yeah, so if 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 everything goes right for the D backs, it is not hard to see. And the Giants, like, they don't hit their upside, but they just kind of have their floor and they're are solid. But the D backs have the potential if they hit on their upside to surpass the Giants. But I mean, I I honestly think they could do it. Maybe the pitching maybe isn't quite there for me when i look at some of the guys but i don't know how i don't exactly know how these young guys who you've got coming up are gonna factor in and and that makes a big difference if sudden uh, obviously corbin carroll has arrived but you've got like three other guys by many publications who are like top 15 prospects in the game and a lot of them are close yeah. to the major leagues and so if those guys come up and reach their potential then this team could be really really good and yeah so i agree with you i i think i'd have I'd have the Giants ahead, so we disagree there. But I oh, think perfect. I think I agree, and that I respect the the upside and the, and the young talent coming for Arizona. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to a thousand dollars. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to threes drained. I'm currently looking at the upcoming Warriors game against the Pelicans. Warriors are favored and the point spread is what I'm looking at at minus 4.5 with odds of minus 110. And so you can check that out. How about WBC action as well coming up that gets underway next week. I can't wait to talk about that as well. So don't miss your chance to get a no sweat first bet up to a thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Yeah, the D backs are going to be a huge wild card just because of what you said. All the young talent that they're gonna have, they're gonna have like maybe two rookies in that rotation. They're going to have Corbin Carroll, who's a rookie. Jake McCarthy, you know, he, he had like a half season with the D-backs last year. Like this D-backs team is so young. It's going to be so inexperienced, but they got such good upside with the with, with so many of those young players that 
I just think the ceiling is going to be higher than the Giants and that all those young players, I think, are going to – because with the new rule changes too, I think it's just going to affect the D-back just because this D-back's team has so much speed on it. I think speed is going to be like a major factor for teams this year. That's like my big proclamation, which I don't think is like some outlandish take or whatever with the bigger bigger bases, the pitch clock, and the only two pickoff attempts per plate appearance. I think steals and speed is going to be a major factor and weapon this season for MLB teams. I think the D-backs might be the greatest benefactor of that rule change. And so, Ben, since you believe the Giants are going to finish ahead of the D-backs in the standings, would you officially like to make a wager on this podcast on who's going to finish higher? We don't have to come up with the details, but would you like to bet on which team will finish higher in the standings? I I absolutely would because I'm not just, you know, playing to the camera. I think that the Giants are better, but and you think the D-backs are better, but I think it's interesting. So, yeah. I think that I'm happy to do so. And I can't lie. I'm always biased whenever I talk about the teams I love. It's just so hard. I try to be impartial, but it's so hard to not just feel emotionally wrapped up when you have to cover these teams and talk about them every day. It's like, I just want to see the D-backs be successful. It's so hard to not pour my emotions into it as well. So it's always a little bit of wishful thinking when you do these kind of bets. But we'll have to probably announce on Twitter, maybe talk after the show about what kind of details should be going into this season-long bet. Maybe we'll announce it right before the start of the season. But there will be a wager listener. There will be a bet between Ben Kaspik and I, Locked On Giants versus Locked On Dimebacks. Ben, before we go today, any parting words? Well, I just wanted to say when you mentioned speed and athleticism and and that it even ratchets up in importance this year, I don't know if you remember, but I remember very well. The Diamondbacks were a major problem for the San Francisco Giants last year precisely because of their speed and athleticism. And it just, like... They, the Giants matched up so poorly with Arizona last year. And so I wonder, like, somehow the rest of the league had an okay time with the D-backs. But the Giants, I mean, they couldn't hit Merrill Kelly. That was a whole other <laughs> thing. He just, that guy dominated the San Francisco Giants last year. Um, and so, you know, when I talk about moving on from Evan Longoria, they also the Giants also moved on from Brandon Belt. These were guys who were just veterans, dealing with injuries all the time and, like, slow and so hopefully I think for me this year, the Giants are going to be not, it's not going to be such a stark comparison, but yes, the D-backs have that and fans of the Giants saw that firsthand. And if you can do that to the rest of the league and just kind of impose your will athletically and with speed, it's exciting. It's a fun brand of baseball and we uh, we saw how it can work when, when the Giants were playing the D-backs last year. That's my final yeah. thought. Yeah, Giants were nine and ten against the D-backs last season. So it's not like we molly whopping no, guys. We're, we're, like if there was one more game, we probably would have been ten and ten against each other. Perfect five hundred record against each other because they're pretty but, evenly matched. What was the D-backs total record though? Uh, the D-backs was seventy four and whatever, like eighty eight, whatever losses that is. Yeah, and and it was the nature of a lot of those losses, like the way that the D-backs won was just like athleticism and speed and just the giants had no answer for it when they were getting beat and i, I think towards forget- the end of the i think the giants swept in the end of the season and so it was the d-backs had a much i think the giants swept in their final series but so i think before that it, it was i guess six and six and ten no and I, I i can't do math while <laughs> doing a podcast <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually looking at it now. The D-backs actually won the last two series against the Giants. So we actually Oh, what? The, yeah, we fin- we had a walk-off. It must have been the Rockies. Yeah, yeah last game, D-backs versus Giants. D-backs walked it off, actually, for the win. So that was a pretty pretty nice feeling. Yeah, the Rockies huh. you swept in that last series. You guys destroyed the Rockies. You guys were like 15-5 uh, and five against the Rockies last season. You guys absolutely uh, <laughs> Those guys. Up. But I do want to ask you, actually, before we go today, Ben, just real quick. You could give me however long it could be a one minute answer. You could take another 10 minutes if you want. Just give me your quick thoughts on the pitch clock. Okay. Um, it could, it you seems have a little fa- It seems someone. a little bit fast, but what I, from what I understand, the first week in the minor leagues when they tested it out, there were like 1.7 violations per game or something. And the first week of spring training, there's like 1.7 violations per game. But by the you know, by I think a month into the year in the minor league season where they were using this, they were down to half a violation per game. And so players get used to it. And so I think if you're watching spring training right now and it seems rushed and there's a lot of violations, relatively speaking, that's because it takes time to get used to it. And 
look, I was a purist. I was adamantly against the DH coming to the NL. I was <laughs> adamantly against the pitch clock. I was adamantly against banning or restricting shifts. But the pitch clock, I think, is going to end up being one of the best things to happen to baseball in a long time because the guys just take too long to get into the box. Not every one of them. And to pitch, you know, just... And to new fans, young fans, like in the modern world, just you turn on a game and a lot of people just see what what are they doing? They're just standing there and they're not doing anything. And just you're not losing any action. You're simply losing time between the action. And so it feels a little bit rushed. Like I'm okay maybe thinking about adding a couple seconds to the clock perhaps, but just the idea of it, once they get used to it, you won't notice it as much. People will just play at a better pace. And I think right now, give it time when the players adjust and you don't you see a violation only one time every two games that you watch versus, you know, multiple violations per game. I think if you're violating multiple times a game, it's too much. But ultimately, I think it's it's going to be great because the pace is important and it had slowed down too much. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts. I have to know. Yeah, I am totally in on the pitch clock. I am in on anything that leads to offensive production, more action, or just the efficiency, like you said, between the action. Because a lot of pushback is from either old generation claiming, oh, this new age, the microwave generation, they go on TikTok for 10 seconds and they have no attention span. Yes, part of that is true. I won't deny new generation people have a shorter attention span than the people of yesterday. But also, you can't deny the fact that baseball games are getting increasingly longer with no added action because you look at the average time of baseball games the last five years, they've been over three hours. I think in 2021 or 2020, the average length of a baseball game was like three hours and 10 minutes long. The peak of baseball was the steroid era, the 80s and 90s. Back then, a baseball game on average was between three hours and 35 minutes, or not three hours, two hours and 35 minutes and two hours and 45 minutes. And if you go back further, the further you go back in baseball, the shorter times were. In the 50s and 60s, games were under two and a half hours. Those things were like two hours and 20 minutes long. So we've added so much time over the years without getting better offensive production. You would think the offense would be getting better at the same time. Maybe that would lead the to the increase in the, the, the games being longer, but part of its pitchers are getting better. They're striking out more. So at bats are longer, but if, if we're not getting more action and these games are longer, it's like we need to figure out a way to condense the action. I think the fact that we're getting a pitch clock, we're banning the shift, we're getting the pickoff attempts lessened. Like, I love the idea of games flying by because me and you, we're West Coast guys. Every game we watch starts at 7-10. And guess what? Some of those games with the extra innings go until midnight, and I don't want to be recording post-game podcasts after 11, after midnight. So the idea of a game starting at 7-10 and then ending at, like, 9-30, it's just really appealing to me as a baseball podcast host. And you don't miss any action. It's the same number of outs, same number of innings. You're literally just missing the time when the batter steps out, readjusts his glove, looks at glove, batting gloves, looks at the sky, steps up, you know, pitcher steps off, blah, 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 all that stuff. And again, once, once the players get used to it, it won't seem, it'll just be played at a crisper pace. And so the, I think people are going to, it's one of those things, people just don't like change. And I yeah. think it's one of those things where, People are going to realize this is what happened in the minors, including players, former major leaguers like Matt Carpenter, uh, you know, was in the minor leagues last year. And he said initially he hated it and then it did not take him long. And then he said, I love it. And so I think that's what we're going to see. Fans are going to realize it's it's good for the game. Players are going to realize it. I think we're already seeing it. I, I feel like there's always going to be naysayers, but it's going to be one of the best changes we've made in a long time to the sport. Yeah, I think over the next three to five years, baseball is going to kind of make a, a comeback into the national talking audience just because the pace of play, like we just talked about, we're going to get robo umps. Like once games are like two hour, two and a half hours long with way more action between pitches, with the 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 less complaining between every pitch, every ball and strike, just seeing a clean executed game. Maybe you got to replay every now and then for the safe uh, for, you know, calling somebody safe for out. But I just think we're going to get so much more efficient action, get so much more efficiency from um, balls and strikes. I just think the game is going to be so much better. We're going to get so much more offense with the band shift. I love the direction baseball is moving because so long it was stuck in its ways. And now it's finally seeing the world of evolution. I love it. Ben Kaspik of Lockdown Giants, where can the listeners find you on social media? 
On Twitter, at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. Pretty active on there, tweeting out a bunch of stats and what have you about the Giants. And it's a lot of fun, so check me out there. And where can my listeners find you? Yeah, at Creator Thomas 24 for the personal account, or just look up Lockdown Dimebacks about Twitter, Instagram for the podcast handle on all your podcasting streaming platforms. And please hit both of our YouTube channels with a subscribe, Lockdown Dimebacks and Lockdown Giants. Ben Caspic of Lockdown Giants will come out with our little wager details probably right before the season starts, but very excited to see a little bet between our two teams because I'm really in on the D backs this year and I hope they don't disappoint. Ben. Thank you for joining today, sir.